If you play or watch a lot of tournament poker, you've probably noticed that in the past year or so, it's become much more common for players to make an unusual play where they risk most of their stack, perhaps only leaving one chip behind, but not all of it. Let's examine why this play has become so common and whether or not it's something that you should also start doing. Before we get into the video, please do go ahead and like this video and subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. It helps us keep bringing you the best content that we possibly can. There are two primary versions of this play that you might see. The first version is where a player raises anywhere between half and three quarters of their stack pre-flop, leaving themselves a few big blinds behind. And the second version is usually done on the river, where a player might leave one big blind behind or perhaps one physical chip in a live event. But before we dive into the strategic aspects of this spot, let's talk about the elephant in the room. The fact that quite often when you see players doing this, they're doing it for the purposes of allowing themselves to stall their way through a pay jump by waiting until the last possible moment before putting their last chip into the pot. Now, players have a lot of different opinions on this, but my personal stance is that whether it's live or online, stalling is not only bad for the game because it makes the game a lot less enjoyable for recreational players, but it's also a form of soft cheating because it allows shorter stacks to silently collude with each other by slowing the game down, forcing fewer hands to be played and reducing the ICM advantage possessed by bigger stacks. There are many other arguments against stalling, which I won't go into in this video, but for now, it's enough for us to simply say that we're going to disregard stalling as a potential reason for making the almost all-in play, and proceed with discussing the more strategic reasons why we might do it. Let's start with the first version of this play, where we put most, but not all, of our stack in preflop. And the reason for that is that it has a lot to do with ICM and the concept of risk premium. In particular, this play is mostly applicable in situations where we might be massively disincentivized from being involved in any three-way all-in pots, and instead benefit more from allowing someone else to bust before us. Essentially, the idea is that raising a big chunk of our stack without actually going all-in allows us to always call it off whenever we're in a heads-up all-in scenario, but occasionally find a fold whenever someone else is potentially going to be at risk instead of us, allowing ourselves to gain a pay jump that we otherwise might not achieve. Here's an example from the GTO Wizard archive. In this spot, we're at a final table with six players remaining, and the average stack is still at 40 big blinds. However, we're in the low jack with 10 big blinds, and we are the shortest stack of the six. The sim has the option for a two big blind raise, an all-in, and most importantly, a six big blind raise. This is what's going to allow us to study the option of risking most, but not all, of our stack. And you'll see that a majority of our final table sims in the solution library do include this option for short stack players, as well as including the option to 3-bet or 4-bet for most of the effective stacks for players who are deeper stacked. As you can see, the 6 big blind raise option is actually the most prevalent part of the low jack strategy here, and the all-in size is not used very much at all. If we isolate the range of hands which is using the 6 big blind raise sizing, it's quite close to what we would usually expect a 10 big blind jamming range from the low jack to look like. It's not drastically different from a chip EV jamming range for the same spot. The reason we're doing this becomes clear when we start looking at what happens after we make it six big blinds. If, for example, the player in the cutoff reshoves for their 20 big blind stack right here, then our folding frequency once the action gets back around to us is exactly 0%. It's only four big blinds more to call, and our risk premium against the cutoff, as you can see here, is only going to be 4.1%. So, we just can't justify folding when there's only four big blinds more to call. However, if the cutoff shoves, and then this big stack in the small blind here with 70 big blinds finds a call or finds a reshove, now, when it gets back around to us, the equation completely flips around, and we're actually folding hands as strong as pocket tens here at a very high rate. And even pocket jacks is very close. The value of leaving ourselves four big blinds here when the cutoff is guaranteed to be at risk against the small blind is very significant. And crucially, our risk premium here is massively inflated because we know for sure another player with a bigger stack than ours is already going to be all in and at risk. So we know there's probably around a 40% or so chance that they bust and we get a pay jump. Now you'll notice that Queens Plus and Ace King Suited aren't in the range here. The reason is that they're choosing to min raise preflop for the purpose of actively inducing more action from the players behind. They're trying to get value. But the other portions of our range, the stuff that is generally preferring to either be all in and realize all of its equity, 
or just get everyone to fold, that's the stuff that's preferring to use the six big blind raise sizing. You might be wondering here whether this kind of strategy is exploitable by our opponents. Well, the answer is no, because the ICM parameters of the spot are going to heavily constrain our opponent's strategies. The big blind, for example, can't really start calling the cutoff shove wider just because they know that we're always folding once they call, because they still need to have pretty high equity to call the cutoff shove in the first place. As you can see here, the big blind would only call that cutoff jam with jacks plus ace-king suited, half of ace-king off, and a little bit of pocket tens. Similarly, the cutoff can't really adapt to the fact that they know we're never folding to their jam if it goes heads up, because they have to factor in the presence of three players left behind them who have them covered and might wake up with a strong hand. So they are essentially just facing a 10 big blind all in, or close to it, in the same way they would be if we had jammed. The same principles apply to most other heavy ICM spots as well. Let's look at another one. Here's an example of a four-handed spot where we are in the small blind here with 30 big blinds facing a raise and a three bet from two covering stacks. Instead of adopting a shove or fold strategy here like we would often in chip EV, we're actually going for an approach where we raise to about 15 big blinds, which obviously is roughly half our stack. Now, normally we would never even consider folding after putting in half our stack pre-flop considering the price that we're getting. But in this case, we're actually fine with it because if both players shove, our range for calling off is gonna be very, very tight. In fact, if we make it 15 bigs here and the cutoff and the button both go all in, we're actually folding pocket kings. We're only getting it in with aces because our risk premium here is so high. This strategy can be applied in any preflop spot where ICM implications are significant. However, there's only one scenario in which we have no reason to bother with it and that's when we're heads up preflop and there's no possibility of a three-way or four-way all-in pot. In this next spot you can see here, we are six-handed at a final table and the big stack min raises from the low jack. We're in the big blind with 10 big blinds as the shortest stack, and even though we have the option to raise to around half our stack or 4.5 big blinds, we're never using it because there's no strategic benefit. Its main purpose is to cater to the possibility of multi-way all-ins, and that can't happen in this spot because everyone else has folded so we're heads up against the low jack. And in this case, we just have a very simple calling and all-in strategy. We have no small three bets whatsoever. So now that we've seen the spots in which raising half or most of our stack can be strategically viable, let's take a brief look at how we want to construct our ranges when we do this. We'll go back to the first spot that we looked at where we raised to six big blinds from a 10 big blind stack to provide an example. I've changed the color scheme here to make it a little easier to see the differences between the sizings. The first thing to take note of is that the all-in strategy is used at a very low frequency here, and most of the hands that take that option are also mixing in the six big blind raise, with the exception of king-queen suited. This makes it very reasonable to conclude that the existence of the all-in sizing isn't really mandatory here at all. We could quite easily simplify our approach to a min raise and a six big blind raise without needing to use the all-in size at all. Based on this, our analysis of the strategy here can focus on splitting hands into two categories, based on whether they prefer to use the min-raise sizing or the six big blind sizing. If we start by isolating the min-raise sizing, clicking on the orange bar over here, we can see that it's quite polarized. It's primarily hands which are strong enough to raise and call off, which is going to be anything that is in this upper region up here, or hands that are raise folding even to one player such as the ace-7s and ace-6s, or the ace-10s and ace-9s here, a little bit of this offsuit Broadway stuff here, those hands that have some blocking power but are not really strong enough to shove. By contrast, the range for raising larger, if we merge together the six big blind and the all-in sizes, is primarily composed of hands which prefer to be all-in against one opponent, but are heavily disincentivized to either be all-in multi-way or put themselves in a min-raise and decide kind of a spot. This is how we end up with that 97% folding frequency against two all-ins, because most of the hands which make it six big blinds in the first place are not at the top of our range. They're specifically hands which aren't strong enough to raise call, but aren't weak enough to raise fold. As we said before, this is not too dissimilar from how a 10 big blind chip EV strategy might look in this spot, it's just tighter. Spots where we have a polarized min-raising range and a condensed jamming range are actually quite common. 
The only real difference here is that we're raising 60% of our stack instead of actually going all in. So that's the basic guide to the pre-flop version of the raising most of your stack play. But what about post-flop? After all, we're quite rarely going to be involved in multi-way post-flop all-ins, so the equation has to change as a result. Well, it does change because the post-flop version of the raise most of your stack play actually occurs almost exclusively on the river. And in particular, this is where you'll see players in live events just leaving themselves one single chip behind. This might seem very unusual, so let's break it down and try to figure it out. It all hinges on the fact that when we shove all in on the river in any spot, we're doing it with a highly polarized range. Very strong hands and very weak hands. This is important because it means we're never going to have a hand which actually has an awkward decision when calling off our last chip. We're getting an incredible price, so even the bottom of our value range should clearly call it off, while our bluffs are weak enough that they simply can never win, so they have no reason to call it off, even if they're getting 100 to 1 pot odds. To illustrate this, here's an example sim I built with GTO Wizard AI. Obviously it's just a chip EV sim, but it illustrates the point quite well. It's a spot where we check raise the flop in the big blind versus hijack formation at 50 big blinds on an 886 flop and barrel off on a blank run out. When we get to the river, I've run two separate sims, one where we shove all in and one where we bet 24 big blinds, leaving ourselves 1.4 big blinds behind. As you can see, the EVs are very similar. It does make an extra 0.1 big blinds to shove all in, and we're able to do it with an extra 0.8% of our range, but that EV difference is only around 0.2% of the pot so it's not a consequential change either in EV or in strategy. In addition, if we look at the strategy for what happens if we bet 24 big blinds and get shoved on, it's very straightforward. I've increased all the boxes to full height to make it clearer, but essentially everything with a queen or better always calls off, while only a couple of our ace-high bluffs, which are low-frequency hands anyway, are indifferent to calling off our last 1.4 big blinds. We're really not in any substantially tough spots here, and our EV doesn't change a lot compared to shoving all in, as we saw. However, the real magic happens when we add ICM to the equation. Let's imagine this specific situation occurs in a $100 tournament with 200 runners and 50% of the field remaining. In the solution library, our hypothetical risk premium for this spot if all stacks are equal would be around 3.5%, given the field of 200 players and the resulting prize pool. But when we're actually faced with the decision of calling off our last 1.4 big blinds after betting the river in this spot, things get more complex. Our numbers here aren't precise because we're not accounting for each player having paid an ante into the pot, but they're fine for now. The first thing to note is that when there's a lot of money already in the pot, we end up in the strange scenario that our bubble factor is less than one. We're being laid a price in a way that doesn't apply when we calculate our bubble factor at the beginning of a hand. Our bubble factor here is actually 0.16, which seems extremely low, but it makes sense given the fact that we're calling 1.4 big blinds to win a pot of just over 100 big blinds. When we convert that number into our equity required to call, we get around 13.8%. But if we looked at this spot in terms of basic chip EV, we're getting more than 70 to 1. So we would only need around 1.4% equity to make the call break even. This means that the risk premium on our last 1.4 big blinds here is a massive 12.4%, even though our risk premium before the hand began was only about 3.5%. So what's going on here? Well, essentially it all comes down to the fact that as we effectively get closer to the bottom of our stack, our chips become progressively more valuable. Putting our last chip into the pot and risking busting out of the tournament is a very significant decision. So even when we're getting 70 to 1 here, there's a big risk premium placed on us. Instead of only needing to win less than 2% of the time, we now need to win just under 14% of the time. In addition to this, while the math behind how ICM affects value betting is complex enough that it's not worth diving into in depth just yet for this video, we also have a decreased incentive to go all in for value. The ICM worth of the additional 1.4 big blinds that we gain when we win is insignificant compared to how much we lose when we run into the top of villain's range here. As a result, what we end up with is a spot where there's a big benefit to risking almost all of our stack, as opposed to all of it. We're still going to end up putting our whole stack in when we're value betting and villain raises, since we're virtually always going to have enough equity to offset the risk premium. But we now no longer bust out of the tournament when we're bluffing and the trade-off in terms of the ICM value of our last chip is more than favorable. It is, however, very important that we don't put ourselves in tough spots by leaving ourselves one chip behind in a spot where our range does contain some thin value. 
Those thin value hands are exactly the hands which might be in danger against the range of hands with which Villain does decide to raise and go for our last chip. So those are the ones which might feel tempted to fold despite the price they're getting. If you want a good example of when not to make this play, check out the three-handed play from the 2022 WSOP main event final table. The player who eventually finished third made this play for thin value with top pair and ended up agonizingly calling off his main event getting incredible pot odds only to lose to the nut straight. So that's the summary of both versions of the almost all-in play. We do the first version, the pre-flop version, in spots where we're looking to avoid a multi-way all-in, and the second version, the post-flop version, we're looking to shove the river effectively with a polarized range but preserve that last chip. For more information on post-flop ICM, stay tuned to this channel because in the future we are going to have videos covering those topics once we have some post-flop ICM capability in GTO Wizard AI and in the Solution Archive. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on Discord. I'll be happy to answer them. But that's about it for this video, and I'll be back again with some more content soon here on YouTube. Thanks for watching, and good luck at the tables, everybody.